بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي My respected viewers, I welcome you to our Jews summary. Today, inshallah ta'ala, we will be looking at the Jews 4, which includes the rest of Surah Ala Imran, as we said, up to Ayah 200. And then it introduces Surah An Nisa for about four or five pages, but it only covers 24 ayahs or verses of Surah An Nisa, this Jews. The reason being that most verses, most uh, ayahs in Surah An-Nisa are quite long. And Surah An-Nisa contains 176 ayahs, but it's quite a long chapter. It also stretches over to actually Jews. So today, inshallah ta'ala, we'll focus on what uh, the reminder of Surah Al-Imran has to offer for us which is the, the main bulk of Jews 4. And we will, of course, also introduce Surah and nisa and maybe uh, read one section or a, a verse or two from Surah and nisa as well in today's session. That's what I have intended, intended to do. So Surah Al-Imran, as we said, had 200 ayahs, 200 verses. The last part of the Surah, which belongs to Jews 4, uh, for the path of the Quran, part of the Quran, uh, talks about Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, right at the beginning, uh, we have the mention of the Holy Kaaba and uh, the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, and then we have uh, this notion of exploitation and arrogation, which are uh, nicely explained in section 8. Uh, and then we have the parable of the bitter wind. Uh, so just in case you are wondering, like, what, what is this? What is it? So I will, inshallah, read that ayah for you. And if there is a need to explain the parable more, I will do that. But usually parables or similes are always uh, easy, easy to understand. Then again, this is the section we need to focus on. The pious and heedful are described, uh, some, of, some of the really best uh, verses that describe the truly pious and heedful, a very nice section. And then again, uh, we learn about the Prophet's trials with the Battle of Uhud, which happened in the year three after Hijra. And this is uh, why uh, we, in a way, uh, label this whole session as the pursuit of selfish ends and the loss of courage because of what happened to the Sahaba or uh, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ during that battle. As you all know the story, I won't have time to re uh, narrate the whole story, but we will read uh, a few verses which in a way uh, point to this. And then uh, the end of this surah uh, is concluded with the town crier, uh, which is given as another figure. Uh, and it, at the very, very end, we also have uh, the last, the second last page, I should say, the very last few concluding verses of this surah are some very beautiful supplications as well. So we may read uh, some of those verses because there are so many ayahs, as you can see by now, we are in Jews 4, and there were so many great, great prayers, supplications, uh, that we can basically memorize and just say them. Uh, they are from the Quran and they mean a lot and they are very comprehensive indeed. Uh, and then this will take us, uh, this is now towards the end of Jews 4, uh, to the beginning of chapter 4, which is called Surah An-Nisa, which means the, the women. Okay, so this chapter, as I said to you, has 176 ayahs, which are arranged in 24 sections. And I told you most of the verses somehow are quite long. Some of them are almost the entire page. This surah is also a Medinan revelation, a Medini surah, if you want to say. It was uh, revealed uh, in the fourth year uh, the Prophet ﷺ spent in the city of Medina. Uh, and it was uh, revealed, we, we understand, after Surah Al-Mumtahana, but before Surah Zalzala. Okay, and I think somebody asked me, like, uh, when was the end of Baqarah revealed and Ali Imran in one of the questions? Like we said, some parts of Surah Al-Baqarah, like the very last bit, 
were revealed much later, okay, uh, some of the very, very last verses of the Quran around the farewell pilgrimage. Uh, so Surah Al-Baqarah was revealed over a long period of time, it seems like, on different batches, but the majority of, of that was in, in the first and second year after uh, Hijra. But Surah Ali Imran was revealed uh, after Surah Al-Anfal, we understand, but before Surah Al-Ahzab, because Surah Al-Ahzab was also one of the latest revelations as well. So uh, we obviously, with these long surahs, we know that there are certain ayahs, certain verses, like, uh, for example, uh, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, even though it was a late revelation, uh, or in Surah uh, An-Nisa, there could be some verses which, like uh, at the end of Al-Baqarah, which date back even to the Meccan period, like towards the end of Meccan period. So there could be one, two ayahs, a particular section that was revealed uh, well before. But the Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba to put it when they were writing the Quran down in this chapter, in this place. And this obviously was on the instruction of Sayyidina Jibreel ﷺ. So we know the Prophet would read the uh, Quran, whatever was revealed to him every Ramadan. And obviously in the last Ramadan before the Prophet ﷺ passed away, he read the entire Quran twice. And this was very important because Jibreel ﷺ told the Prophet the actual order of the verses in each surah. But we understand that some verses were revealed like years and years apart in the same chapter and that is not a problem at all it's just these these chapters are really long and they talk about so many different themes yeah subject matters and it makes sense that they need to be put in 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 one uh one unit one one coherent unit so this is uh surah and nisa it deals mainly obviously with women's rights and conditions after the Battle of Uhud again. And this is how we also know that this surah must have been revealed after the Battle of Uhud, because it's a, a very strong uh, reply, or you can say a response uh, to the actual condition uh, in which the Muslims found themselves in, in Medina after the Battle of Uhud. So it basically deals with all those issues uh, like marriage laws, how to treat women, as the actual title of the chapter suggests. Uh, in fact, the word uh, an nisa uh, has been, you know, used throughout this chapter. You know, every now and then, every page, more or less, you read of this surah, there's something that talks about the rights of women and, and mentions women. So that's why this surah was named Surah Tun Nisa. And there's no other chapter which has this much emphasis, I would say. And it's a long, actually, very long chapter. So right at the beginning, this is the part which belongs to Jews 4. The subject of orphans is mentioned very in, in a nice detail, actually. Then uh, especially the, the, the uh, girls, orphan girls, yeah, that were left after the Battle of Uhud. Then uh, the, the men's duty in maintaining their household is also mentioned in detail. And then, for example, some marital disputes yeah, or conflicts are also mentioned, uh, mentioned and how they could be solved. Inheritance is also dealt in this surah right at the beginning as well, like second uh, section, you can say. Or we can even say first and, and second section of the surah and the third. Uh, and then uh, some uh, offenses are mentioned, like uh, adultery and fornication and what kind of penalties deserved for that. But also some etiquettes and, 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 and manners are mentioned also uh, in this surah in sections 11. But section 3, in a way, talks about uh, uh, who are who are the people who are prohibited for us in marriage? And then obviously tells us the rest that they are not. And loads of rules about marriage and dowry and so on and so forth. And this in a way is the uh, conclusion of uh, Jews 4. So it's like four sections, more or less, or less than three sections of Surah and Nisa. Uh, but there's quite a lot basically mentioned therein, uh, which ends the Jews 4. Uh, 
and of course, inshallah, tomorrow we will tell you what uh, are the other main topics or subject matters that uh, Surah and Nisa has, uh, as we explain Jews 5, inshallah ta'ala. So now, let us read, inshallah ta'ala, a few sections uh, from the Quran and, and try to explain it, inshallah, as, as it comes. So the first ayah of this juz actually is very important. Allah says, أَسْتَعِذُ بِاللَّهِ لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّوا You will never attain true virtue or righteousness until you spend uh, from what you love, yeah, or from what you love most. While Allah is aware of everything you do and whatever... Uh, Little you spend in Allah's cause, Allah has the knowledge of it. Like Allah will acknowledge it for you. So this ayah is very important and uh, we have many accounts, Sahaba, when this ayah was revealed, some of them, they went on to basically gift to give in Allah's way things that they absolutely loved most. Some of them gave their most favorite gardens. Some of them would give their most favorite food items. Some of them would give their most favorite, uh, maybe uh, clothes that they, they liked or shoes, something like that. Uh, so they, in a way, literally understood this ayah. So they felt like we will never become proper good Muslims unless we start giving in charity things which we ourselves uh, love most or things that are so uh, dear to us so beloved to us so this is very interesting because this notion of being kind and generous I can't really overemphasize it it is very much the core of one's piety or righteousness or virtue so when you actually can spare from, from your belongings and I remember there's this poet who says like give a bit of yourself don't be so selfish, like you can't uh, separate from some of your belongings and possessions and give it in Allah's way, for Allah's sake. That is a sign of stinginess. And especially like when it comes to you, you don't want to give any of your precious time or precious self, if you want to say it like, like that. Don't be selfish. Be kind and generous. Even if it means give some of yourself, it doesn't mean literally. What it means is give your time and give things which are dear and, and love, you know, beloved to you, uh, things which you absolutely love. You shall see the difference. That really means that you care about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than you, more Allah basically, and his messenger more than you love yourself. So this is why this link between uh, kindness and generosity and piety and virtue is so strong. Yeah, and, 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 and it really matters and it's important. Then in this uh, first uh, section, we also have the notion of pilgrimage or the first house of Allah. Actually, Al-Kaaba is described in this surah in Ayah 96. <laughs> and we have a nice piece of kiswa actually in our masjid. We are so privileged. And on that kiswa, this ayah was inscribed. Yeah, 96, which means indeed the first house of worship set for mankind was the one at Becca. Yeah, and Becca is just another name or variation of saying the, city, the ancient city of Mecca. Becca, Mecca means the same thing, it's the same city. It was blessed and a guidance for everyone in, in the universe. In it are clear signs, so like Maqam Ibrahim, yeah, as we mentioned, Ibrahim is mentioned at the beginning. Anyone who enters, it means the sanctuary, the Kaaba, will be safe therein, secure and safe. And then what is mentioned? Pilgrimage, Hajj. Pilgrimage to the house is a duty imposed on mankind by Allah for anyone who can afford a way to do so. Anyone who disbelieves will find that Allah is transcendent beyond any need of anyone anything or anything so basically the institution of hajj is mentioned here which is the fifth pillar of our religion and this is the ayah which we obviously use uh, from the quran which tells us very clearly just like i read that ayah to you about fasting uh, a couple of days ago which clearly says any one of you who is not a traveler who is a resident stays at home and 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 you know is healthy and and, and a grown-up in Ramadan, we must fast, okay? Uh, in the same way, this ayah says, making hajj 
to Allah's holy house in Mecca, yeah, to the Kaaba, is a duty. Yeah, uh, it's it's an individual duty imposed on us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But again, as we said, they are uh, requirements if you meet those conditions. So anyone, manista ta'a sabila means if you can afford your way there, if you can afford to go there. This also could include as well, like physically, if your health doesn't serve you and you yourself can't go, you're not healthy enough to make that journey, and it is uh, exhausting, as I said, then you might send a deputy on your behalf to perform the Hajj for you, but you will still have the reward, and the person you send for you will have the reward as well. But the obligation still will be upon you, okay? So if you don't have the material means and you are prevented from going there and you can't find anyone else to go on your behalf, then we say it, it is not a duty upon you. But we have this beautiful uh, notion, really, uh, you know, people who, upon whom the Hajj was, you know, let's say, obligatory, a must, and they, they missed on the chance to go like sudden death or something happened. So their family members can fulfill that duty of theirs on their behalf. And this is very beautiful because we had several accounts of people who knew that their parents were pious and good, and they had a very strong, firm intention to do and make the Hajj fulfill the fifth pillar of Islam. However, they passed away or something happened and prevented them from going. So those people asked the Prophet, what if I went on behalf of my mother or my father or my late grandparents or uncle? The Prophet said, yes, do that. They will have the reward as if they went themselves, so will you for going on their behalf. So in a way, it seems like Hajj al-Badal has like a double reward, like it's more rewarding and it's a beautiful basically way of remembering our deceased uh, parents or people who are loved to us, could be a spouse, and doing something nice, uh, righteous on their behalf, they benefit, you know, uh, they receive the rewards of it, so will you actually uh, experience the Hajj and benefit from this uh, great uh, ritual. So I didn't have a chance to read this, I'll read it, read it now. So pilgrimage has been also mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah before, and this is what Allah says, pilgrimage, Al-Hajj Ashurun Ma'lumat. Pilgrimage falls during specific months, so we can't go except during the month of the Hijjah. That's when the pilgrimage is a specific time. Anyone who undertakes the pilgrimage during that time should not indulge in un, you know, indecent uh, actions, nor any immorality, nor wrangling during the pilgrimage. Like no arguing, no, no rubbish, really. Allah knows about any good you may do and make provisions and know that best provision is be, becoming pious. Yeah, doing your duty towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Allah ends this ayah by saying, Fattakuni, you know, be conscious of me, heed me, have fear of me, if only you are intelligent enough to understand that. So the notion of pilgrimage, the institution of pilgrimage is mentioned, as you can see, in Surah Al-Baqarah in that sense. And here Allah mentions again Ibrahim, Abraham, and the house, the, the, the holy Kaaba as the first uh, house of worship uh, established on the face of this earth and the pilgrimage uh, to the house being a duty to Muslims once in our lifetime. So this is about this section. Now, I would like to move uh, to the next section, uh, which is section uh, 11 of Surah Al-Imran, but it's straight uh, you know, early, still early in these Jews, just one or two ayahs I want to read here because they are so central. All you who believe, it begins. Heed Allah the way he should be heeded, like be conscious of Allah, have fear of Allah as you should, and do not die unless you are a Muslim. So you see now this again, this was in Surah Al-Baqarah several times when different prophets were mentioned mentioned and we kept saying the ending of those ayahs was wa nahnu lahu muslimun here allah says do not die except as a muslim just like sayyidna uh, yaqub asked his children okay uh, when when he was on his uh, deathbed okay and the same you can say uh, ibrahim gave the same will okay wasiya uh, 
to his children. So it seems like this is a very important notion. We have to do our very best praying to Allah SWT to keep us firm on this religion, steadfast, so that we, we stay on it until we breathe our last. And have taqwa of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala as we should develop it. And listen to this advice to Muslims and other people, but to Muslims because wa tasimu. There is this wa uh, atuf, yeah, uh, conjunction and cling firmly together. So all you who believe and cling firmly together by means of Allah's rope, yeah, hold fast. Yeah, onto the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you want me to translate it like that more literally, and do not be disunited, don't separate, okay, stay together, basically, in other words, be united, hold firmly onto the rope of Allah, all of you together, and stay united, remember Allah's favor towards you when you were enemies towards one another, he united your hearts, so you became brethren, brothers, and sisters because of Allah's favor or due to Allah's grace and favor. And you were on the brink of a, of, a, of a pit and Allah saved you from falling in it. Therefore, Allah explains his signs to you so that you may attain guidance, that you may become guided. So, of course, uh, I hope you will understand why I chose to read these verses as well. They are so important in today's time and age, especially when Muslims seem to be, uh, you know, disunited on different fronts. They need to remember that Allah has asked them. This is an obligation, actually. It's a command from Allah to hold fast onto the rope of Allah and to stay united, to be united. Uh, and also to remember that when, when Muslims were united early on, it was due to Allah's favor and grace. Now, if we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his uh, grace and mercy, he will basically, inshallah ta'ala, give us enough, you know, willingness and, 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 and uh, energy and ability to unite uh, once more, to be united again. Because the only way to move forward uh, is basically to, to, to be united. Let there be a community among you who will invite others to do good, command what is proper, yeah, and prevent dishonor, wrong behavior, and those will indeed succeed. Don't be like those who split up, yeah, uh, and this, who are disagreed after explanations or clear explanations had come to them. For them, there is a painful punishment or torment. So basically, just reaffirming, like, among us should be a community, those people who enjoy good and forbid evil, bad, yeah, uh, prevent dishonor, indecencies, those will succeed. And again, don't be, yeah, don't be like those who split up, okay, uh, and those people who keep disagreeing on everything, like, we can't even agree to disagree nicely with, with good etiquettes and manners. But every opinion, we just strive to basically cause this unity and this court, and we try to show that we hold a different opinion. Well, let us try to unite and be unanimous as much as we can in all views, but there may be some opinions and points we cannot hold the unanimous uh, view about it. We can have different positions on them, different standing or opinions about it, but let us be still respectful you know, respectful towards one another and, and, and have what we call adabul uh, ikhtilaf, okay? So uh, the Quran says, when clear signs have, and explanations have come to you, why do you still insist on disagreeing? This is what it actually means. Stop doing that. Are you doing that just for the sake of being different or trying to show that you are above someone else and differ from them? If that's the case, then this is not a good sign. Yeah, and likewise, the warning obviously given at the end of this eye is that such people, uh, you know, will have awful torment, a painful, painful punishment in the next life. Okay, so uh, remember that, please, inshallah ta'ala. Now I would like to move to the next section. Um, in case you are just wondering about the wind parable. So I'll read for you this uh, ayah, one ayah, really. 
uh, which mentions it, but it's uh, this, uh, the parable of, you know, uh, Allah mentions of people who spend, yeah, in Allah's way. We explained already nicely towards the end of Surah Al-Baqarah as well. But listen to this parable, it's quite different. So Allah says, مَثَلُ مَا يُنْفِقُونَ فِي هَذِهِ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا yeah? Talking about those who disbelieve and neither their wealth nor their children will help them out. Yeah, those who disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any way they won't be helped. So Allah says then, what they, <clears throat> yeah, what non-believers spend during this worldly life, so whatever they give uh, in charity in this worldly life, is compared to a wind containing bitter frost, which strikes the crop of people who have injured themselves or, or transgressed against themselves, and so destroys it. فَأَهْلَكَتْهُ Like the whole, everything is destroyed, ruined. Allah has not injured them. Allah didn't do any transgression or oppression against them. But rather, they transgressed against themselves. They oppressed their own selves or they injured themselves. So this is why uh, <clears throat> it's called, you know, uh, the parable of bitter wind because we certainly don't want something like this to happen to our charities that we give solely for Allah's sake or purely for Allah's sake. So I hope you will remember this parable. Uh, it's very strong actually. And this is why the Quran in Surah Al-Kahf mentioned like the most pitiful people on judgment day, like most miserable, or you can say like uh, people who will regret the most are people who thought that they were doing good in this worldly life, like that they were kind, charitable, or praying and righteous and pious and scrupulous, but they didn't understand that their iman, their faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not correct. So they did it all for the wrong intent, with the wrong intention, for the wrong reasons. So, you know, like they, you know, like all of their deeds will be shown to them as big mountains, and then suddenly it will be all scattered. Yeah, like into dust, like a wind will come and blow it all away. And then they'll be like, it's all disappeared in the air, nothing. So their deeds, which they have performed, will basically melt away in front of their eyes. And they'll be like, so devastated by that scene. Why? Because they are akhsarul a'mala. The worst of all people, like or most miserable of all people, because they thought that they were doing good. No, but yet they were doing wrong. Uh, so... We, I do feel sorry for, for someone like that, but that's why we read the Quran so that it doesn't happen to us. We, you know, we, we, we do our very best to not to belong to such camp of people. We just uh, want to make sure whatever we do, even if we give something very little, we want to do it for Allah's sake with the right intention and not want to spoil our charities, as we said in Surah Al-Baqarah. Okay, so that section... Uh, was just, you know, that parable was just one ayah. The main section really is this one about describing uh, truly pious people, uh, traits and qualities of righteous people. So Allah says in Surah Ali Imran from verse 133 up to 136 or 35, hasten towards forgiveness from your Lord and a garden, Jannah, paradise, broader than heaven and earth which has been prepared for those who do their duty, for the pious. Who are they? Here is the description. Those who spend for others throughout happiness and hardship. So they spend in fortune and misfortune, like uh, easy times and hard times, hardship, and suppress their anger. So one is, again, looking fuck, honestly, like I'm, the Quran mentions this all the time. Yeah, being giving, yeah, in charity, being charitable at all times, it looks like. And then second is suppressing their anger. So they control their temper, their anger, and also overlook what other people do to them, like pardon other people. Yeah, they, they're not obsessed by that. Allah loves those people who are righteous and kind. And those, so more qualities go on. So truly pious, righteous, if you wish, are those who remember Allah and seek forgiveness. So remembering Allah is important, seeking forgiveness. Yeah, remember Allah and seek forgiveness for their offenses when they commit some like uh, sinful deed 
or cause harm to themselves. So they commit a sin or transgress against themselves, yeah, uh, injure themselves. So they rem as soon as they uh, commit a sin and they become aware of it, they remember Allah and seek forgiveness. That's what the more literal meaning is, really. So uh, for who forgives uh, sins besides Allah? So who other than Allah will forgive us our mistakes and shortcomings, our sins? No one but Allah. Yeah, And do not, so he carries on now, there's another quality. Uh, so those people who do not knowingly persist in whatever they've been doing wrong. So like they commit, we are humans, we are weak, forgetful. Uh, you know, we might commit a sin, let's say, or make a mistake out of forgetfulness or weakness or, you know, given to the temptation. But when we become alert to it, we are aware, we try to repent, okay, to Allah sincerely, and we seek his forgiveness, okay, we remember Allah. So here a quality of truly pious people are those people who will not persist in keep doing the same sin again and again and again, over and over and again. So they don't persist in whatever they've been doing. So, وَلَمْ يُسِرُّ عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا We did something evil or wrong or sinful. Now we repented and we made a firm promise, yeah, resolution not to go back to that sin. That will basically make you uh, fall in the category of truly pious and righteous people. Okay, so this is very important because you don't want to risk Allah will forgive you every time you repent sincerely to him and forgive. Believe me, that's what the Quran says. That's what the Prophet told his Sahaba. He, every time when they got worried, he told them never ever be worried. Allah's forgiveness is much greater than, than the amount of sins you can commit and the enormity of sins you can commit. But there's a huge danger of us, you know, when we start being careless and, and committing sins, developing that a habit of ours, a pattern that we keep doing, and then we are not seeking forgiveness. We, we just, we are so lazy or tired and don't care. We have lost the modesty, for example. We don't remember Allah after we have erred, erred or sinned, and we also don't repent, nor do we seek forgiveness. That is the danger. So the Prophet, ﷺ, he said, Allah will never get tired of forgiving people, but people may get tired of making uh, repentance, repenting and seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why we warn against sins. Stay away from sin is much more important than doing an extra optional deed because when you go and, and, and cross the boundaries, yeah, transgress the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you go into that territory which is not doing you good and then you keep indulging yourself in it and go deeper and deeper in it, maybe there won't be a way out because we said, yeah, that is the evil way which might lead all the way to disbelief. So may Allah protect us from the sinful acts of any nature or any kind. And for example, the ritual of fasting that we observe nowadays in Ramadan is a shield exactly from something like that. So it's so powerful of a shield, just like daily prayers are, the prayer itself as well. Even the act of remembering Allah, the dhikr itself. But fasting is particularly Junna, the Prophet said. Yeah. So it shields us, protects us from falling into haram. And this is very important to stay righteous. Okay. Those will have, so the conclusion of this section is those will have forgiveness from their Lord. So Allah will certainly forgive them as their reward for their efforts. And in addition, will give them, yeah, enter them into the beautiful gardens through which rivers flow to live therein forever. How blissful will such wages or reward be for, for the, the good doers, like the good people, the righteous people. Yeah. In fact, it's like al-amil is mentioned here, like uh, believers who make effort. So how lovely, how wonderful and blissful the reward will be for people who keep making effort. I don't need to say here pious or righteous. You know, uh, you keep, you know, doing what uh, this section described. Inshallah ta'ala, you will have a wonderful and blissful reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one that you'll never regret. Uh, inshallah ta'ala. So may Allah make us among the truly pious, righteous, uh, loving and caring people. And those who, who uh, uh, 
constantly repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek his forgiveness because we certainly need Allah's forgiveness. Now moving to the next section, uh, section 15 of this surah. Uh, one or two ayahs again, I'll just read. I can read a little bit more as well, but to complete the section, but one or two are the key. So this is the first time in the Quran, in verse 144 of Surah Al-Imran, that our Prophet's uh, name is mentioned. So our Prophet is mentioned by his name, personal name. وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ And this ayah was very important, actually. It was revealed, as I told you here, uh, during yeah, uh, after the Battle of Uhud, the fourth year of after Hijrah, so look what it says. Muhammad is only a messenger of God. Messengers have passed away before him. Like there were other messengers of God and prophets who came before him and they also died before, you know, they passed away before him. If Muhammad, if he should die or even be killed, will you all revert to your old ways? Like would you abandon this new religion that he came with? Turn your backs. Anyone who turns on his heels will never cause any harm to Allah in any way. While Allah will reward only the grateful. Yeah, so those who are grateful with whatever happens, like they were uh, privileged to be around the Prophet, to become his companions, yeah, friends. Now Allah takes his Prophet, he dies, they're left without Prophet, a living Prophet. They should not, you know, uh, Turn, turn their back and, and go back on their old ways, like turn on, on, on their heels, as the Quran says. Aqibay. Instead, they should still remain ever grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for having the privilege of being uh, the Prophet's companions, okay, or seeing him even once, uh, or being around the time when he was sent, yeah, when he lived. So the, the main point really here is like, maybe two points, I should say. The main one really is that the Prophet is mentioned by his name. That's not the key, key, crucial, important thing because he's mentioned uh, the whole Quran is revealed to him and, and, and the whole address is to him in a way hundreds and hundreds of times with, with a personal pronoun, to you, 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 and it's all Muhammad. Or him, it's all he, Muhammad. So uh, that is not it, but the, the, the point really is that uh, the Prophet Muhammad was a human being like us. Uh, yes, he was among Allah's chosen ones, means Allah's prophets and messengers. So he was one of Allah's messengers. Uh, so he lived in this life and he also passed away. He died. And, and the Quran says here, even like prophets and messengers can be killed by other people. You know, even that can happen to them. But whatever happens, we would still follow their message, their legacy. That is the main point here. So whatever happens... If you do something about this religion and you start choosing this and that because the prophet is no longer around you, you know, reminding you or seeing you, uh, not accompanying you anymore, then you should know that you will only cause harm to yourself. You can't do any harm to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, but always be grateful. And look at this maxim which follows. So the prophet Muhammad is mentioned and his death in a way. So when he actually died... Uh, let's say six years later, okay, we can say that, or seven years later, after this ayah was revealed. Some of the Sahaba almost forgot that this ayah existed in the Quran. So they couldn't believe, like, in the sense, of course, it must have been absolutely hard for them to accept his death. But he did die, like every other person will die. Yeah, every soul shall taste death. It's mentioned, we will mention this in this chapter, in this juice. So it was Abu Bakr who remembered this ayah and he recited it and everyone calmed down. Because this is how Allah prepared them in a way. Like he revealed this long ago and they forgot about it a bit, like not thinking of the Prophet's demise and departure. But when it did happen, then he reminded them of this. And Umar would say like, ooh, I almost forgot that this was part of the Quran. How dare we like do that? Of course, Muhammad was a, a human like us, a messenger of God who lived he passed Allah's message to us. We are so grateful for that. We are living his legacy now. We are praising him, sending peace and salutations upon him. But we accept that, uh, that he also died. And we will stay following his sunnah, yeah, his footpath, his uh, example. So look what Allah says as a maxim after. No 
soul shall die except with Allah's permission at a fixed time. When the fixed time comes to every one of us, we will all die. There is no exceptions. And also it's important to remember from this maxim that no one will die unless that destined or fixed time or time has come to them and Allah's permission is given to the angel of death to take our soul from our body. So in that sense, there is a reassurance. We don't know, nobody knows their actual uh, fixed time, the, the time when they're going to die, which is good. So we don't panic just as it's coming. It comes even to a person who is 90 plus years old at a surprise, like suddenly. So it's from Allah's grace and mercy that it, Allah made it like that. And he also said to us that none of us will die except with Allah's permission, like when Allah has decided and given the permission at our fixed time, which we don't know. It gives us reassurance, like we, we are not afraid of everything that happens to us, getting ill a little bit here and there, being hit by that, falling over there and there, because we have this kind of reassurance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah that, yeah, I might get badly injured or really ill and sick, but it doesn't mean I'll die from that sickness or illness or injury. Yeah, I might survive because I'll only die when, when my time comes and Allah's permission is granted. So this is very beautiful uh, maxim that we must remember. And there's a similar maxim, let me remember that as well while I'm remembering it. Let me mention it. No one will accept Islam become a Muslim without Allah's permission. Yeah, so no soul will also accept Iman, become a Muslim, uh, unless Allah has given the, the tawfiq, yeah, uh, the, the permission uh, for the person to become a Muslim. So these, uh, these are very amazing and important maxims for all of us. Okay, now let me move to the next section. I'm really running out of time again. Okay, so this section here, uh, still Surah Ali Imran, uh, Allah mentions the Prophet ﷺ and him being so uh, welcoming, so loving, so soft and gentle towards his companions. Okay, yeah. However, since mercy from Allah does exist, you have been easy on them like his companions. And if you had been harsh or cruel hearted, like hard hearted, they would have dispersed from around you. Pardon them, seek forgiveness for them and consult with them on every matter. So this is how the Prophet was, and this is how Allah instructed him to be with his companions. Now, I will never understand why would some Muslim scholars be harsh on their followers and not, uh, you know, uh, preach the same traits and qualities that Allah mentions of his beloved Prophet, Ali Salaam, here. This is how we are supposed to be. Follow the footsteps of our master, true master, the Prophet, Ali Salaam. Otherwise, people will run away from us. Yeah, if we are harsh on them and cruel hearted. So gentleness, softness, tolerance, mercy, you know, kindness. This is really what, what, what is needed when we preach about Islam and when we live Islam. You know, and I'm talking here even like parents to their children need to behave in this way. So look what Allah then says in the next ayah. Yet once you have reached a decision... So in Yansurkumullah, so here, Faida Azam Tafatawakal ala Allah, uh, Allah, of course, is talking to the Prophet Ali Sallam himself. But you will see that this uh, order uh, or ayah extends to us in a way as well, like I just said. Yet once you, Muhammad, you have reached a decision, then rely on Allah, like Tawakal ala Allah. Yeah, Fatawakal ala Allah. Allah loves those who rely on Him, who are reliant on Allah. So when we reach a decision, we want to do something, then we, we take everything into account, measure all precautionary met, you know, measures, and then we rest on Allah. So we rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we can do well. And I, I, I can't help myself but to say like, that's exactly what I learned from our Shaykh Abdul Hakim when he was about to begin this project of this new mosque here. You know, that's more or less what he did. Um, and then Allah says, if Allah supports you all, there is no one who will overcome you. So if Allah, if Allah comes on your side to support you along your way, in your project, in your matter, whatever it is, then you should know that you will certainly succeed. 
Yeah, no one can defeat you. Like no, can, no one can overcome you. While if he should forsake you, who is there left to support you later on? But on the other hand, if Allah didn't uh, become your supporter alongside your way or you know, for your project or whatever you do, then you should know there is no other su true supporter who can support you. Yeah. Uh, when Who will truly, uh, you know, take you out of your humility and 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 and, and being forsaken? No one but Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Uh, so. The, the message is repeated again. So on Allah, the true believers must always rely. Like the true believers will always rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, so, uh, so on Allah should true believers rely and only on Allah. Okay, so this is the section. Uh, now we are almost finishing Surah uh, Ala Imran, which is also, like I told you, the ma majority of Jews. Here is the maxim, as I already mentioned it. I 185. Every soul, every soul will taste death. And you will be repaid for your deeds on the day of resurrection or judgment. Anyone who is snatched from the saved from the fire of hell and shown into the gardens of paradise will have triumphed, would have succeeded. Yeah. Won. Faqad faz. What does worldly life mean except the enjoyment of illusion? <laughs> so, you know, the, the Hayat Dunya is, is here described as Mata al ghurur So, like illusionary enjoyment, like a deceit. Yeah, it's not the real, real enjoyment. The real enjoyment is in Jannah. So, so this ayah is really uh, strong, I have to say as well, like, Almost you can say this deserves to be a section on its own. Every soul shall taste death and we will all be repaid for our deeds on judgment day. And anyone who is saved from the fire of hell and placed into the gardens of paradise will have triumphed properly. And remember, this worldly life is like nothing but a, a deceit. Yeah, it's, it's nothing, you know, the enjoyment of this life, whatever we have is not real. It's like an, illu an illusion, an illusion, okay? So remember this ayah, please. I mean, it's, uh, I can't tell you how important it is. So let me read those prayers as the end of the surah. For example, Allah mentions people who remember Allah while standing, like standing in prayer, or even standing not in form of prayer, sitting like this, or even lying down yeah, on their sides. And those who meditate on the creation of the heavens and the earth by saying these prayers. So Allah compliments, yeah? Yeah, so he praises the people who remember Allah so in all those postures, who contemplate, meditate over the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creation of heavens and the earth, so everything in, that we see, and then say these du'as. So as we do that, this is how we should pray. O oh, our Lord, you have not created all this, yeah, your creation in vain. Glory be to you. Shield us, protect us from the torment of hellfire. The next dua. O oh, our Lord, anyone you sentence to the fire of hell will be humiliated. Wrongdoers will have no support therein. O oh, our Lord, we heard a crier appeal for belief calling out so this is the what i told you in the description the crier appeal yeah so munadin a caller crier or a caller calls to all of us aminu believe okay a appeal for belief calling out believe in in thy lord believe in your lord and then aminu qalu amanna and then they say, so we say, قَالُوا uh, آمَنَّا Okay? رَبَّنَا لِمَانَ نَامِنُوا بِرَبِّكُمْ فَآمَنَّا Yeah? أَنْ آمِنُوا بِرَبِّكُمْ Believe in your Lord فَآمَنَّا And so they answer, we have believed. We, we, we do believe. And then they say, O oh, our Lord, forgive us our sins and mistakes. Remove our evil deeds from us. Wash us away from it and gather us up at death time with the righteous people, with the noble people. 
and then again, O oh, our Lord, give us what you have promised us through your messengers and do not humiliate us on resurrection day. So this is the notion I wanted to emphasize. We pray to Allah SWT never to, to humiliate us on, on when it matters the most on judgment day. I can't really tell you, my brothers and sisters, how important this dua is. Please remember it. Sayyidina Ibrahim often prayed this. And other prophets did too. And our prophet did. And the Quran mentions it. So should we? Of course we should. Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to humiliate you on judgment day. And then Allah uh, and the prayer, innaka la tukhliful mi'ad. You, Allah, never go back on any promise. So whatever Allah promised the true believers will be fulfilled, inshallah ta'ala. Fastajaba lahum rabbuhum ikarizon. So their Lord responded to them, to their prayers. I shall never waste the work of any worker among you, whether it is a man or a woman. Some of you come from others. Okay, I shall remove their evil deeds for those who have migrated and were driven out of their homes and mistreated uh, just because they are Muslims for my sake and have fought in my way and were even killed in my way. And I shall, I shall admit them to a garden through which rivers flow as a reward from Allah himself. And Allah holds the best of rewards. Well, subhanAllah. So, uh, this, uh, I remember Mawlana Ibn al-Arabi uh, encouraging people ar around his time when it was really difficult times uh, for the Muslim Ummah. Around his time, there was a lot of divisions and split different dynasties and, uh, you know, betrayals on the Sultan, the Muslim leaders. He kept reminding them by these verses, saying like, Okay, if this is not the place for you now, because the, the Mongols are attacking you, make a hijrah. Okay, and, and remember, you know, whatever happens to you, any one of those of you who are killed in Allah's way, uh, being tortured, oppressed, remember the great reward that Allah has prepared for you in the next life. So these verses are absolutely amazing, unbelievable. And I have to tell you that the Prophet asked us to read these ayahs. Uh, some narrations say after we wake up, this is a dua, it's prayers. And some say before you go to sleep. In my opinion, it's best if you did both. Okay. Uh, but certainly it's included in many books of the car for the morning uh, dhikr. Now it's Surah An Nisa. Uh, I'll just read one ayah, as I told you. Just one is enough uh, because the other topics are mentioned in the next juice, really, which I want to focus on. So Allah says at the beginning of this surah, O oh, mankind, yeah, heed your Lord who created you from a single soul and created its mate from it. So Sayyidina Adam and then Sayyida Hawa alayhi salam from Sayyidina Adam. And he uh, spread a multitude of males and females from them too, from the first couple. Heed Allah through whom you hold one another, one, one another responsible, as well as any ties of kinship, yeah, maintain ties of kinship. And Allah is ever watching over you. Allah is watching over you. Give orphans their property and do not substitute something bad for something good, nor swallow up their wealth along with your own wealth. It would be a great sin, outrage. So here you can see in the beginning of this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that we all come from the first couple. Yeah, Sayyidina Adam and Hawa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also reminded us here that he spread multitudes, many, yeah, uh, males and females from the first couple. So we are all ch the children of Adam in that sense. And the key point really is a very strong one. Remember that Allah is watching over you. This is the key message. So whatever comes after this, you know, in terms of injunctions, rules, and there are many actually rules in Surah and Nisa, like I just told you here, like give orphans their property. Okay, don't cheat on them. Look after the women. Uh, uh, divide the inheritance properly, as you should. These, these, are, what, these are the topics which are mentioned here. Okay, uh, And Allah says, these are Allah's limits. Anyone who obeys Allah and his messenger will be admitted to gardens of paradise through which rivers flow. And they will stay there in forever. And that's the greatest achievement by anyone who disobeys Allah and his messenger and oversteps his limits will be shown into a fire to live therein forever. 
and that will be a humiliating punishment for that torment. So uh, this is very important. And listen to this one more ayah from the end of this uh, last page of the Jews. Repentance holds with Allah only for those who do evil out of ignorance and then repent shortly afterwards. Those who turn to Allah and Allah is aware, all aware and wise. And repentance is not for those who perform evil deeds until one of them says, oh, I have just now repented. And this was just as death comes to them. Yeah, the death faces them the pangs of death have already come nor is it for those who die while they are non-believers these believers for those will have uh, we have uh, reserved a painful torment well may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who promptly repent this is the message and and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those people who who will remember that allah is watching over us at all times so that we don't maltreat orphans we look after orphans and we know there's a great reward for it we also kindly treat our women and especially orphan girls uh, and 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 we 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 equally treat our children yeah and 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 divide the inheritances as allah instructed us and so on and so forth and as I said at the end, we repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, promptly and we, in, we promise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we will not repeat uh, the same sins that we did in the past. Uh, again, let me just see many messages. Uh, one message says that we should do these sessions before Isha. Well, I'll have to think about that. Uh, another one says, as I saw some very nice verses today and I was thinking uh, for prayer. Uh, yes, so those verses which are Rabbana, Rabbana prayers, you should use them in your salah as often as possible, like the last page of Surah Baqarah, this la second last page of Surah uh, Al Imran. These are beautiful duas. Uh, is it telling us how to resolve marital disputes. Okay, so that's next Jews. I'll talk about that next Jews. Uh, apart, striking, okay, I'll talk that next Jews. Is staying united means we should leave all different sects and schools? No. So basically, a madhhab is like a school of thought. It is good to have, you know, a, a proper, you know, properly structured system that you follow, which explains to you how to worship, what is allowed, what's not allowed. Sectarianism, yes. We can't afford to, to, to split into sects. But be mindful, uh, some of the groups that we have in Islam, they are not sects at all. There were some sects, they don't exist anymore, like Mu'tazilites, for example, or Jabriya or Qadariya, like people who believed in total predestination, like they believe whatever they do, they are forced, like it doesn't matter. You are forced to do this session now. You are forced to watch me and this and that. So, it, uh, or the total opposite, like you have absolute free choice of will. You can do whatever you like. Allah is not aware of everything and this and that. Those are sects. We can't be like that. Uh, but Madhahib are not sects. Shafi, Hanafi, Hanbali, all four, even Shia, Imamis, they are all uh, Muslims. Okay, and they are not sects, they are just schools of thought, like school of law, uh, which help you have to practice your religion. It means we are united as long as we follow any of those four Sunni Madhahibs, or Imami, Shi, you know, uh, Shia or Zaidi, uh, you will be actually uh, under the one same umbrella, a Muslim. What if the vast majority of Muslims are misguided? Should we, st uh, should we stay together with them or have to follow the truth? Well, this is a good question. So we want to believe and hope the majority of Muslims will never be misguided and off the right path. There is a hadith which suggests like towards the end of time, there'll be like one firqa najiya, one group, and it's not going to be like very big and, and they will be like seen as outcasts. I, I don't understand that hadith myself very properly. Uh, and I know that there were different groups in, in, in very recent times like ISIS, who believe that's them, you know, but clearly they were very extreme and, and you know, went astray themselves. So I don't want you to think like that. Uh, I would say the vast majority of Muslims, you know, will always be, you know, moderate, the middle way. Uh, so we need to stick with the jama'ah. Yeah, Yadullah al Jama'ah. Allah, Allah is with, 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 the, with the united front, yeah, with people who are united. 
I've seen children less than two years old, things like harassing. How can they do such things while we know that all people are born on fitra? Well, okay, maybe uh, I'll have to leave this one for another time when we have mention of children, maybe. Or actually, there are verses which talk about fitratullah illati fatara nasa alayha. So I'll, I'll mention it then, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, so this uh, fitra that we are born on can be corrupted easily. Uh, tafsir books to understand Quran. Yeah, Tafsir ibn Kathir, Tafsir al Qurtubi, you can read uh, Tafim al Quran of Mawdudi, you can read uh, Tadabur al Quran of Amin Islahi. There are so many actually, uh, Tafsir al Alusi, uh, you can read Tafsir al Jalalain, uh, all those Tafsirs you will benefit from them. And Qurtubi uh, is translated, uh, Sayyid Qutub partially translated, uh, Tafsir al Manar partially translated, Ibn Kathir translated in abridged version and full, uh, Tafsir al Tabari, I think, parts translated, so a Tafsir al Nasafi partially translated. So there are so many, mashallah, uh, and I do recommend those. Of course, if you can read Arabic, the best is to read them in Arabic. Can I get advice on inheritance? Well, uh, everybody's uh, inheritance is specific. So, you know, this is something, you know, they are actually softwares now where you can enter. Who is actually left behind? Is it wife or husband? How many kids? How many boys? How many girls? How many sons or daughters? How many siblings? Are there any parents alive as well? Mom or dad? So you enter it in a software. There's a tool basically which divides inheritance according to Islam. It's very clever, but it's quite accurate. So I advise you to, to use that to, to come to get hold of that. And if not, then you know you can email me or give me a call or meet me and tell me your exact uh, case. And then I can give you advice based on that. Because every case, as I said, is different, but there are some general maxims or principles which the Quran mentions in great detail. I didn't read it because I felt there was no need. It's so self-explanatory. It was in the end of this juice. Uh, so you can read those portions. They are fixed. No one, no scholar can mend them or change them but we know how to apply them depending on the actual case. I'm afraid I've run out of time again. Uh, Barakallahu feekum. Thank you so much for your time, your attention, and, and, and uh, you know, uh, willingness to listen. May Allah bless you and reward you. Please spread the message. Uh, let as many people as possible benefit from uh, you know, reading Quran and listening to the explanations of the noble and holy verses of the Quran. Uh, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, deepen our understanding of the holy book. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us any mistakes or shortcomings that we made in this commentary or explanation and in general. I also pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the highest levels of Jannah and to accept our fasting and our prayers, all of our ibadat in this blessed month of Ramadan. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله العظيم لي ولكم فاستغفروا إنه الغفور الرحيم سبحانك اللهم نستغفرك ونتوب إليك ونصلي ونسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه و